So this is the Gospel of Matthew, or Matthew for Beginners. This is lesson number eight, entitled The Use of Parables in Jesus' Teaching. And uh, if you're following your outline, this is going to be discourse number three. You know how we do it, narrative discourse, narrative discourse, how Matthew's broken up. And if you're following along in your Bible, uh, we'll be doing chapter 13, chapter 13. All right, in the previous narrative, we see Jesus and His teachings being rejected by the religious leaders and by the majority of people to whom He is preaching. They begin to doubt. They begin to make accusations. In the next section, we see Jesus beginning to use parables to teach the people. He wasn't using them until then, but the minute the pushback comes, He starts using parables to teach the people. And we see Matthew explain that Jesus did this in order to do two things. One, uh, it was the method He was going to use to teach His disciples. The disciples believed, so they had the key to the parables because the key to the parables is the deity of Jesus. And number two, He used parables in order to keep hidden the things of the kingdom from those who disbelieved and rejected Him. So there were people who disbelieved and were rejecting Him, but that were listening to Him. They were hearing the stories. They were hearing what He was doing. So He couldn't say, all right, all those who disbelieve, you know, go away. I only want to teach the ones who believe. No. So He used parables you know, with two, uh, two objectives in mind. So the parable was the perfect format to be used for this dual purpose. So in the section that I'm going to talk to you about uh, uh, this time, uh, we're going to talk more about parables than the actual parables that are contained here. And the idea is if you understand you know, about parables and how they're used and so on and so forth, you'll be able to better understand not only the ones we're studying here, but you know, any of the parables that you come across. All right? So let's start with just a definition, shall we? The word parable simply means to place alongside, to put something next to something else. Um, in context, it signified the placing of two or more objects together in order to compare them. So if you're thinking parable, what is a parable? It's actually a comparison. It's where you lay something down next to something else in order to, um, in order to examine them. So in the New Testament, what is happening is that seen things, material things, are put beside unseen things in order to reveal the truth, the ideas behind the unseen things. So it was a good teaching tool uh, because first of all, it was easily understood by those who were not well educated. And secondly, uh, it was easier to remember. The story, always a, you know, a great way to remember. Who doesn't remember you know, the story of the prodigal son? I mean, it's just so impacting, right? Uh, usually, it was an imaginary story about something that could have happened, but is simply used to illustrate some higher spiritual truth. So what do I mean by that? Well, I mean that parables were not fables. They weren't myths. You know, they weren't about elves or you know, Middle Earth people or things like that, right? They were actually couched in stories that were real, about real people with real situations. Even though Jesus was telling a story, the story could have happened because it was about common things. You know, a, a woman needing bread, a, a son, you know, a lost son going away from his family. Everybody could relate to those kind of those kinds of um, stories. Um, now some people kind of um, you know, debate whether some of the parables are real or if they're parables. The one that comes to mind is Lazarus and the rich man. And some people think, oh, you know, that's actually a teaching. You know, it's not really a parable. Others say, no, it's a, a parable pointing out something. So you, know, you can argue it both ways, but there is some debate on some of the parables if they're true stories or parables. Also, parables are not a device that, was, uh, that were invented by Jesus. He didn't invent this type, of, uh, you know, this type of device in order to teach. Uh, we have an example of a parable in the Old Testament in 2 Samuel chapter 12, when Nathan the prophet 
uses a parable to reveal the sin of David. Remember David and Bathsheba, he seduces this woman, she gets pregnant, you know, he, he, he plots a scheme to have her husband killed, murdered, and then he covers everything over and you know, takes her as his wife to cover the fact that she, he's made her pregnant. So he's done a lot of bad things and he thought he'd got away with it because now everybody's going to think, oh well, you know, the baby she's carrying must be David's baby because you know, he married her and so on and so forth, except he couldn't hide that from God. And so Nathan the prophet goes to see David and he doesn't start by saying, oh, you know, well, we've heard some rumors. You know, he doesn't say that. He tells him a parable. He says, uh, you know, uh, there's this man who only owns one sheep. He loves that sheep, so on and so forth. And there's his rich man who's his neighbor that has all kinds of flocks. And the rich man receives a, vi a visitor and instead of using his animal, he takes the animal of the poor man, the one sheep that he's got. He takes that animal, takes it away from him, slaughters it to feed his guests. And Nathan says, and King, what would you do with a man like this? You know, and David becomes all self-righteous and says, boy, that person deserves to die. You know, bring him before me, I'll make a judgment call. And then Nathan says, you, O King, you're that person. And so Nathan using a parable in order to reveal the sin to uh, David. Uh, in the New Testament, however, only Jesus uses parables. You don't, you don't hear the apostles using parables. Only Jesus does that. And they are recorded in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Um, only in those three, John does not use parables. He uses figures instead, like I am the vine or I am the door. You know, he uses those type of figures. Um, some of the parables are repeated in more than one gospel and many are exclusive to just one gospel. For example, in Matthew, Matthew gives the uh, parable or recounts the parable of the pearl of great price, that's only in Matthew. Luke, the Good Samaritan, that's only in Luke. All right. Now, in order to draw uh, accurate lessons, and isn't that what Bible study is about? I mean, Bible study is to, of course, become familiar with the Bible, but sometimes the technical side of Bible study, which is what we're doing in this class, uh, the goal is to equip the class with the tools to be able to come to accurate conclusions about the Bible, you know, a procedure to follow when you're studying. So when you're looking at parables, some rules here. First rule, Look for the spiritual truth as it applies to the situation that prompted the telling of the parable in the first place. Okay. For example, it was the grumbling of the Pharisees because Jesus ate with sinners that prompted the telling of the parable of the prodigal son. So if you're, if you're, if you're, you know, if you're trying to you know, tease out the meaning of that parable, first you have to ask yourself, okay, what was the setting? Why did Jesus give that parable? Well, he gave it because the Pharisees were grumbling, because he ate with sinners, you know, he was lowering himself, and so on and so forth. So you have to ask yourself, what does the story have to do with the grumbling of the Pharisees? All right. And of course, at some point, you, know, you, you hear something else where Jesus says, you know, I didn't come to save the righteous. I, I came to look for the sinners. I came to find all those prodigals. I came to find those who were lost, the ones who are saved, the ones who think they're okay. They don't need me. It's the prodigals that I'm looking for. Number two, avoid over, oversimplification or complication. And a lot of times when you see people you know, defend their points, they've usually overcomplicated something or oversimplified it. Uh, so don't look for meaning in every single detail. You know? Don't overinterpret. Again, for example, to say that the parable of the Good Samaritan teaches us that the doing of good to others is the be all and end all of Christianity. That's to oversimplify, right? You, you, I hear sometimes uh, what I call gay apologists, people who defend the gay lifestyle and even believers who try to defend the gay lifestyle using the Bible 
usually use this type of technique. They oversimplify. Oh, the Bible says, thou shalt not judge. And they just leave it right like that. Well, you know, that's kind of out of context. Or the Bible says that we should love everyone. Yeah, it does say that. But the parable of the Good Samaritan is a, is a, is a, is a great parable to teach us about that, who is my neighbor, so on and so forth. But if you say that the overall lesson of that parable is simply that we should just love everybody, period, well, you're leaving out the idea of the cross of Jesus. And <laughs> Why did He come? And the fact that all men are guilty before God and the resurrection, you know, you, you, it might fit if you oversimplify it, but it doesn't fit if you examine it against the rest of the doctrine of the Bible. Yes, you know, it's the old story. Yes, of course, God is love, but you know, God is just too. There's a price to pay for sin. Okay, so let's not oversimplify, and then let's not overcomplicate. I'll give you another example. To look for meaning to direct the way that we operate economically in the parable of the master who paid his workers similar wages. Remember that parable in Matthew 20? The master goes out, hires people early in the morning, sends them out to the field for a certain amount. Then at 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock, sends some more guys out, and at one o'clock, sends some more, and then near, near the end of the day, he sends some more out to his field, and then when it comes to pay them, he pays them all the same thing. Well, if you think that that parable teaches economic theory, you've overcomplicated it. You've overcomplicated it, right? That parable doesn't teach, actually that parable, te that parable is about the grace of God. You know, God rewards us the way He decides, not based on our work. Because in the New Testament, the thief on the cross who simply recognized you know, Jesus' innocence and goodness and power at the very last moment before He died and said, hey, you know, please remember me. You know, I, got, I got nothing to offer you. The thief on the cross never spent a day in church, <laughs> never took communion, never served, never went door knocking, never brought a meal to someone who was sick, never did nothing. And yet Jesus said to him, this day you'll be with me in paradise. And then you have someone like Paul, the apostle, beaten, whipped, nearly drowned, rejected, you know, suffered, ended up being killed, you know, so on and so forth. Here's a guy who was in the heat of battle. And then he went to paradise. Wait a minute. <laughs> you see where the... Does it seem fair? Of course not. Fair is everybody gets exactly what they deserve. But that's not Christianity. Christianity is we get what we get because God is gracious, period. And that's what that parable <coughs> talks about, the master and the, the different ones. So the, my point is, you know, let's not overcomplicate, let's not oversimplify. Look for the general spiritual principle that's put forth. Okay, number three. Remember that parables illustrate truth. A little bit like a picture in a textbook illustrates the text. But parables do not prove truth. In other words, it's not a wise idea to formulate doctrine based simply on parables. So we need to remember that parables are not doctrinal statements. They are figurative ways of pointing to unseen things. So we lay a story down with concrete things next to a spiritual thing that we cannot see so that through what is seen, we may understand what is not seen. That's the purpose of parables. Usually, parables point to some truth which can be found written somewhere else. Like it's not like, a, it, para, Jesus doesn't use parables to demonstrate something that's brand spanking new that no one has ever thought of before. He uses them to point to general truths that are already there. For example, I'll go back to the parable of the Good Samaritan, illustrates love for a neighbor and who the neighbor is, right? But in Luke 10, 27, Jesus quotes the Old Testament scripture to clearly say it. You know, loving God, loving your neighbor as yourself. You know? 
So the parable simply illustrated the idea, but it didn't invent the idea. Okay? <coughs> Rule number four. Look for the meaning or the conclusion within the parable itself or within the context before drawing your own conclusion. So sometimes Jesus gives the meaning of the parable at the very beginning or at the very end, like the rich fool. You know, he explains at the end, you know, if you're not rich towards God, you know, your life will be called at any moment. Sometimes Jesus asks someone else to give the meaning. Like in the parable of the Good Samaritan, he asks, so who, you know, who's, the, who's the neighbor here? Who? He asks the crowd, what do you think this means? Sometimes he responds to a question about the parable from a listener within the group. For example, Peter asks about how something entering a man's mouth cannot defile him. You know, in the, 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 you know, when Jesus is teaching him about things that are pure or impure, and he says to them, hey, nothing that goes in your mouth defiles you spiritually, and he explains, because whatever you eat just goes out of you, it goes in and it goes out. And then he goes on to explain the true, you know, the spiritual truth. He says, it's what comes out of your mouth that defiles you, because what's in the heart finds its way out of the mouth. And if you want to know what's inside a person's heart, just listen to what comes out of his mouth. There's the truth in that parable. And then sometimes, People are left to draw their own conclusions. In Mark chapter 12, verse 12, it shows the religious leaders who begin to draw a correct conclusion that the parable that Jesus was talking about, when Jesus was talking about the wicked servants you know, beating and killing the master's son, master would send you know, different servants to go and try to collect what was his. They beat and kill, and eventually they kill his son. And, and, the, and Matthew says that the leaders understood that he was talking about them. So sometimes, you know, uh, there's a kind of an editorial comment that explains that individuals were, were understanding what Jesus was saying. Usually the primary meaning is contained within the parable and applicable to the situation in which the parable is spoken. I tell people who are learning how to study the Bible properly, what does it say? I don't know, how, what does it say? You know, they read the passage and they say, okay, now, what do you think? And they'll go off on some tangent. I said, but, but what does it say? And they'll say something and I'll say to them, is that what it says in the passage? And they, they look down and they go, no. I said, all right, well, all I want to know is what does the passage say? And that's a, a tremendous discipline that Bible students not often learn. You know? It's like, <laughs> stay in the text. All right, number five. Jesus and His parables are one. So other teachers and other moralists in history can be separated from their teachings. In other words, you know, Voltaire and other philosophers and so on and so forth, they, they, they taught they, they, you know, moral lessons, but they, they weren't talking about themselves. But in the parables, Jesus is talking about Himself. His parables are about Him and His kingdom. The reason people fail to understand the parables is because they failed to accept Him as the Messiah. That was the key. If you didn't believe that He was the Son of God, then you, did, you didn't have the key that opened the meaning of the parables. So they understood the stories, but they couldn't understand the key that unlocked the significance of the parables, and that was that He was the Lord, He was the Messiah, He's the King, it's His kingdom, so on and so forth. So Jesus told them in such a way that in rejecting Him, you shut yourself off from understanding the things concerning the kingdom taught in the parables. And if you, you know, I think you get that, um, that idea, I think you've experienced that, haven't you? Have you ever really tried to talk to somebody you know, that you know, you're friends with, somebody in your family, and you're trying to talk to them about spiritual things, and it's like, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> it's like you're talking, but it's like, it's hitting, you know, it's just hitting the wall and sliding down. They're, they're not getting it. You even feel foolish a little bit. It's like, 
how can I explain this to make sense? And because they're not willing to believe, it just it sounds like, almost sounds like nonsense. All right, so let's talk about the kingdom parables now that we have you know, given a little background in Matthew 13. So Matthew 13 has seven kingdom parables. One implicit, six explicit, and then one small parable about the disciples at the very end. So many of Jesus' parables concern the kingdom and its nature, its coming, its value, and so on and so forth. And the interpretation of these have varied throughout the years depending on the theological position that you hold. So if you're coming at the Bible from the position that it's not really an inspired text, you're going to come to some very different conclusions. So a lot of times people approach the Bible with an already formed theological idea and they just fit what it says into their idea. And that's what's happened many times with the parables about the kingdom. For example, one extreme position, one extreme view sees the kingdom coming suddenly and cataclysmically in the future sometime. A lot of times we call these people premillennialists, the thousand year reign, Armageddon, the rapture, all that. People who think in those terms, when you talk to them about the kingdom, their thought is, oh yeah, it'll come one day, and when it comes, all of a sudden, nobody will be ready and there'll be wars, and you know, that's how they think. And so when they read the parables, all of the parables concerning the kingdom, when they, when they read the parables from their perspective, if the, let's take the simple parable of the leaven, you know, woman put leaven in the bread and made the bread rise, you know, that parable. Well, the people from this perspective, they see the, level, uh, the leaven rather rising in the dough, they see that as something happening suddenly, and it's an image that the kingdom will come suddenly one day in the future. That's how they interpret that simple parable. Another view, the other extreme is that the kingdom is fully realized and it is complete here on earth. And all we're doing is we're just adding to it as time goes by. And so for these people, the leaven rising is simply interpreted as the ongoing growth of the kingdom. Why? Because their view is already formed. They believe the kingdom's already here and it's complete. It's just getting bigger. All right, third position. And I think this is a kind of a middle of the road position. My own personal belief here. I believe this is a more biblically accurate position and it says that the kingdom has been established by Christ here on earth, but it will be fulfilled when He returns. In other words, the fulfillment of the kingdom will happen when He returns, the dead in Christ rise and join with those who are already alive to be with Jesus in the air forever, and the, you know, the heavens and earth pass away, and the wicked are judged, and Satan is bound, and you know, uh, cast away, and the new heavens and earth are created, and so on and so forth, all that happens, twinkling of an eye. So this is a more middle of the road. Yes, we're in the kingdom, yeah, we call it the church. So it's here, we're in the kingdom. This is the thousand year reign. Between the cross and the second coming, this is the thousand year reign. Not 1,000 years, but a perfect period of time that only God knows. Only He knows when Jesus will return. But the kingdom will be fully realized finally when Jesus comes and we have our glorified bodies. And what does it say? And then He will return the kingdom to God. And we, in the kingdom, will participate in the Godhead. Because you're asking yourself, well, what is this about? What is Christianity about? What are we doing? We are preparing ourselves and being prepared to ultimately exist within the Godhead. I mean, that's hard to get your brain around, but that's what's happening. So we have resurrection, glorification, that's our new, our new you know, spiritual body enabling us to exist in the spiritual dimension, but then there's one more thing that happens and it's called the exaltation. 
to be at the right hand of God with Christ. That's the ultimate end of, you know, of, our, of our existence. And where is Christ at the right hand? Well, He's within the Godhead. So that means we will exist within the Godhead. Now how that figures out metaphysically, I'm not quite sure, but that's the promise. So kingdom parables demonstrate the behavior of those who find and who develop within the kingdom until the king returns. That's why they're about watchfulness and being ready and so on and so forth. The leaven is Jesus Himself, and the growth is the work of the saints, and the final outcome is His return. All right, so let me give you some, uh, well, we've got a few minutes left. Let me give you uh, Matthew 13, how it breaks down. <clears throat> I said in Matthew 13, we see seven kingdom parables and an explanation of the reasons for using parables as well as examples of most of the devices concerning parables that I've already talked to you about. All right, ready? So, uh, we begin with Jesus telling the parable of the sower and the seed as a response to the rejection that He has had from the leaders, the Jewish leaders and the people. So that has happened, He's been rejected. His teachings have been rejected. There's pushback from Him. So what does He do? He tells a parable. Which one? the parable of the sower and the sea. And let's just read a bit of that. It says, that day Jesus went out of the house and was sitting by the sea, and large crowds gathered to Him. So He got into a boat, sat down, and the whole crowd was standing on the beach. And He spoke many things to them in parables, saying, behold, the sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell beside the road, and the birds came and ate them up. Others fell on the rocky places where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up because they had no depth of soil. But when the sun had risen, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. Others fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked them out. And others fell on the good soil and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let them hear. So Jesus is telling the parable of the sower and the seed as a response to you know, the pushback. And then He goes on to explain why He will now use parables. Verse 10, and the disciples came and said to him, remember I said sometimes they ask him a question, okay, why do you speak to them in parables? And Jesus answered them, to you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been granted. For whoever has to him more shall be given, and he, who have, uh, he will have an abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he uh, has shall be taken away from him. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because while seeing, they do not see, and while hearing, they do not hear, nor do they understand. In their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is being fulfilled, which says, you will keep on hearing, but will not understand. You will keep on seeing, but will not perceive. For the heart of this people has become dull with their ears. They scarcely hear, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they would see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and return, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear. For truly I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desire to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. So here he explains, based on a question, why is he teaching with parables? One, for the disciples' teaching and a method of separating believers and unbelievers, that's one reason or two in one, let's put it this way. And then also, he uses parables, um, um, uh, and the reason is because he uses parables according to prophecy. In other words, the prophet said when the Messiah comes, he'll teach using parables. So he uses parables. Remember I said at the very beginning of this class, one of the goals that Matthew had, he was talking to Jews, he wanted to make sure that he got across to the Jews the idea that everything Jesus did, the way he did it, why he did it, and so on and so forth, was to fulfill prophecy about the coming Messiah, because that's what the Jews, that was how they would fact check everything that he did. So even his use of parables, Matthew goes back to show the basis of it in Isaiah. Okay? So then you have an example of him 
explaining the parable to his disciples and also giving us the correct commentary about the parable within the text. So let's keep going. Verse 18, he says, hear then the parable of the sower. So that's basically he's saying, okay, let me explain it to you. He says, when, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom, so, oh, oh, the word of the kingdom, oh, that's the seed. Okay. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is the one on whom the seed was sown beside the road. The one on whom the seed was sown on the rocky places, this is the man who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no firm root in himself, but is only temporary, and when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he falls away. And the one on whom seed was sown among the thorns, this is the man who hears the word, and the worry of the world and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. And the one on whom the seed was sown on the good soil, this is the man who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and brings forth some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. So he explains what the parable means to his disciples and to us, of course. Now the remaining kingdom parables are in two groups in Matthew 13, two groups of three separated by uh, two statements and then followed by a summary. So I'm not going to read these, but I just want to show you how it breaks down. So you have parables, the wheat and the tares, the growing seed, and the leaven. Three parables, followed by a parenthetical statement in verse 34, excuse me, verse 34 and 35, it's stuck here, these pages are stuck together. There we go, all right. Parenthetical statement, 34 and 35, uh, that use, you know, that he is using these according to prophecy. Then he has an explanation of the parable of the wheat and the tares as a response to another question. So you know, he gives another parable, somebody else says, well, you know, well, what about this parable? So he gives the explanation to that parable, another parable, the wheat and the tares. Okay? Uh, then there are more parables, the parable of the treasure, the pearl, the net, and then he makes a summary statement at the end. 51, 52, he says, have you understood all these things? You know, he's given them all parables, he's explained a couple of them, he's told them why he uses parables. Have you understood all these things? They said to him, yes. And Jesus said to them, therefore, every scribe who has become a disciple of the kingdom of heaven is like a head of a household who brings out of his treasure things new and old. So he asks if they understand the parables, and they say that they do, and he responds with yet another parable, this time comparing them to a head of a household whose job was to provide for the needs of the household. So they are the providers of the household. The household is the kingdom, and they provide the kingdom what they have been given and what they have been taught and also what they will be taught and what they will see. So what happens here? So he says some old and some new. What are the old truths that they have? Well, the old truth, things that are known and accepted, the law and the prophets, right? The law and the prophets. They had that already. He didn't introduce them to that. They had that already. Those are the old truths. And then some new truths. Well, what are the new truths? Well, the gospel, who Jesus is, the death, burial, and resurrection that they will ultimately witness, those are the new truths. So if they have learned and understood what He has taught them, then they will, uh, they will see how both the old and the new are connected. And how are the old truths and the new truths connected? Well, the old truths pointed to the new truths, <laughs> and the new truths fulfill the old prophecies. And now they have information on both, and they also know how both are connected. The old truths point to the new, the new truths fulfill the old, and when you put them both together, what, what do you have? Jesus is the Messiah, He's the Son of God. So He says to them, you have some old information and I've given you some new information, 
you have all the information you need now to take care of your household. Who's the household? The church. You'll be able to feed the church with what you know and what you've been given, okay? All right, so we'll stop there. I'm going to give you an assignment, but it's a purely voluntary assignment. I want to give you a little personal project if you want a little challenge in your daily Bible study. So I want you to go to Matthew 13, choose two parables in this section, and answer the following questions. One, what is the main truth? Two, what was the parable saying to the disciples at that time? And three, what possible meaning could that parable have for us today? Okay. So you know, put it down on paper, give it to me before the end of the series. This is not like by next week. You know, a little project you want to work on, a little Bible study project. Just give it to me. If you give it to me, I'm not going to ask people who's got their thing. No. If you feel like doing it, great. Do it. Work it. Give me the sheet. I'll give you feedback. I'll let you know. Yeah, good. Work on this, whatever. And at the same time, you'll get just a bit of a taste of what it's like to prep a Bible class or to prep a devotional or you know, to prep you know, a lesson on a Bible topic. I think it'll be an edifying experience for you if you try it. But I understand people are busy, they get lots of responsibilities, of course. But like I say, till the end of the course, you got till the end of the course to, to try it, all right? And you can give it to me anytime. All right, that's the end of the class. Thank you very much.